Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to St Mary's University. I am delighted this evening to welcome Professor James Crossley to deliver, to deliver his inaugural lecture. James, as you know, is a professor in the Bible, Society and Politics at St Mary's in the Centre for the Social Scientific Study of the Bible. As one of our most active research centres, the centre has frequently published important research, holds thought-provoking conferences, and welcomes doctoral candidates from around the world who are drawn to the reputation of the centre here at St Mary's. Professor Crossley joined us here at St Mary's in 2015 after 10 years at the University of Sheffield. His research covers two broad categories, Christian origins and Judaism in the first century, and the Bible in political discourse in the 20th and 21st centuries, of which we will hear more from James shortly, and also in a very interesting week. <laughs> Last year, Professor Crossley hosted a launch for his new book, Harnessing Chaos, again quite interesting for this week, <laughs> which, which, explores, which explores the changes in dominant politicised assumptions about what the Bible really means in English culture since the 1960s. This is getting really very topical. In 2015, Professor Crossley also published Jesus and the Chaos of History, which looks at the way the earliest traditions about Jesus interacted with the context of social upheaval. Away from St Mary's, Professor Crossley has been very active in contributing to numerous biblical studies institutions, having been a member or actively involved in the Society of Biblical Literature and the European Association of Biblical Studies, to name but a few. Professor Crossley has also been editor and are on the editorial boards for a number of journals and monograph series, including the Journal for the Study of the Historical Jesus, Postscripts, Biblical Reception, Religious Studies and Theology, amongst many others. James, we're looking forward to hearing you this evening, but can I formally welcome you on behalf of all the students and staff and the wider community here at St Mary's it's a delight to have you. It's always a delight to talk to you about the Bible and politics, and I can think of no better time than the current. Very welcome. Okay, I'm going to follow my colleague Steve Walton in trying to do this on Facebook Live, so it could go wrong, but not for you. Uh, <laughs> that's a good or bad thing. Um, OK, well, thank you very much, Francis. Uh, and thank you, Mo, and thank you to my colleagues here who've made me feel very welcome over what's nearly two years now, I guess, at St Mary's. Um, I, mean, I said to some people before, there are, there are many people here who are expert... <laughs> so Steve's listening to me, at least. So that's good to uh, Who are uh, sort of <laughs> world-leading experts in biblical studies, world-leading experts in theology, and I ask you uh, humbly to forget everything you've learned over the past however many decades, clear your minds and prepare yourselves for how politicians sometimes use religion and the Bible. And th throughout this, it's worth remembering that anything too problematic, anything too extreme, is very unlikely to make it into mainstream political discourse, whether it's too secular or whether it's deemed too religious, and it will often be a kind of banal, vague um, construction of the Bible as something to do with tolerance, rights and freedom and things like this. And occasionally these things get stretched and I think we're actually in a situation where this is happening right now. Okay, now I will be talking about the current makeup of uh, politics and it's the ways it constructs religion and the Bible in due course, but I want to just go back into the not too distant past to show how we got to where we are today. Um, and that's Margaret Thatcher, I've just had my picture taken with. Um, now, Thatcherism, I mean, there's, there's a whole story here, so I'm going to summarise quite a lot. And Thatcher and Thatcherism, in many ways, grew out of the uh, upheavals of the 60s, whether it's 
uh, a real conservatism or nostalgia for a lost Britain, or whether it's some of the radicalism on the left. And I think uh, 1968 and the sort of leftist 1960s is actually at least as important for the emergence of Thatcherism as it is for the left. Uh, and I think perhaps sometimes consciously Thatcher and the group around her took up the language of liberty, freedom and so on and then reapplied it to economics particularly. Uh, and, and so Thatcher built on a lot of this, uh, these tensions and contradictions of the 1960s and grounded what would become Thatcherism in the Bible quite explicitly really and more so I think than any politicians since uh, and rediscovered you might say cynically, I'm an objective historian, so I might back off here. Uh, her Methodism. Um, you know, as, as a good, as a Tory MP of the 50s, she you know, kind of have to be an Anglican at this point. But challenging the Tory establishment, Methodism, uh, rediscovering this Methodism became important. And she grounded um, issues of entrepreneurialism, freedom, uh, economic freedom, uh, criticism of the welfare state, and the emphasis on charitable giving is in the Bible. The Bible is the source of what would become known as Thatcherism. And she really set the template for politicians since in many ways. Now there's, there's many examples you could give from Thatcher, um, but of course probably the most famous is her use of the Good Samaritan, who she famously argued wouldn't have been able to help the man if, she didn't have, if, if he didn't have the independent means of wealth to do so. Um, and she said this on a number of occasions, including on Walden. Um, but there was also, it wasn't just the Bible, it was religion itself. She had a very interesting construction of religion. Religion for Thatcher, no matter how bad it may seem in the present, has always got this core of good, freedom, individualism, and so on. And she strongly contrasted this and the Bible with Marxism in the Soviet Union. So no matter what religious group may claim to be terrorists, they're not really religious, she would say. Whereas any uh, terrorist group claiming to be Marxist really is Marxist. And uh, she made that very uh, clear. And she thought the Soviet Union was beyond redemption, really. It would just take the great individualism of someone to wake up like Gorbachev and turn things around. So this was very significant in her construction of what she thought religion was and what she thought uh, Marxism, leftism was, with one eye on labour uses of the welfare state. She was very often blurring the lines between the Soviet Union and the Labour Party on this. Now again, to cut a very long story short, the, the Labour Party of the 1990s attempts to come to terms with this, including in, in a couple of publications uh, uh, that would eventually feed into what we call New Labour. And uh, despite some of the rhetoric, despite some of the polemic, Thatcherism was basically, or economic Thatcherism was basically accepted and this understanding of what the Bible is compatible, or indeed the source of, such economic liberalism. And there's nuances, of course. But what was uh, different was what Blair, I think, added to this, and that was a kind of socially liberal qualification to Thatcher's understanding of the Bible. So the Bible now is the source of things like gender equality, equality of sexuality, and really this came to the fore under Cameron and the same-sex marriage debate, where when the Bible was used, when Jesus was invoked in parliamentary debates, it was always in favour of same-sex marriage, interestingly. None of the kind of American-style debates here. What Blair, I mean, there was a bit of Islam with Thatcher, but not very much, but Blair really brought Islam to the fore of English political discourse. Um, Thatcher did, I mean, um, there were issues to deal with Salman Rushdie and so on. And Thatcher did reflect on September the 11th, obviously, some time after she was Prime Minister. But uh, Blair was uh, intensely interested, I think, at least uh, if, if any of the reporting is true, in Islam, uh, owning copies of the Koran, and reading the Koran every day, according to one uh, interview. But he also brought in Islam into the idea that Islam is also, a, a true Islam in his terms, uh, is about democracy, freedom, capitalism, even. Uh, whereas distortions of Islam would be things like then Al-Qaeda, terrorism, totalitarian regimes, and so on. So this was um, Blair's distinct, one of Blair's distinctive contributions. The other, the other important contribution by Blair was dealing with the left-wing tradition in the Labour Party. And the left-wing uh, left tradition, again, to put it crudely, 
um, was equating the Bible with socialism. And Tony Benn was probably at this time the last great uh, example uh, of this tradition. And it was often cast in apocalyptic language, by which I mean New Jerusalem would be the historic way of describing, I guess, in the Labour tradition. But in the 1945 Labour Manifesto, it's, uh, it's all the language really kind of very much based on revelation about, you know, we've had the war, it's flattened everything, and out of this rubble, we will get rid of disease, want, squalor, and so on, uh, and create the NHS, develop the welfare state, and so on. And Blair develops this, and instead of applying it to um, that kind of welfareism in the UK, it's now with one eye on uh, the Middle East and Afghanistan. And really, he, um, the press didn't pick up on this, but at the Labour Party conference in 2001, he was really fairly directly alluding to the 1945 manifesto to justify um, intervention or the upcoming intervention in Afghanistan. Uh, and that's, and I think, probably to keep a fairly wobbly Labour Party on side and those with ears to hear. And it's very interesting that the press barely picked up on this because the press barely do pick up on anything to do with religion unless it's a little weird from their perspective. Now, this template, this sort of Blair Thatcher template, seemed to be uh, victorious in many ways. And Cameron uh, picked up on it and, if anything, intensified this. He, he pushed further on uh, things like um, gay marriage, for instance, being an obvious one. Uh, but also intensified some of the Thatcherite rhetoric. So, for instance, when he talks about big society, Jesus founded big society 2,000 years ago, he said. And from this perspective, things like food banks aren't necessarily a bad thing. This is groups filling in where the state might previously have done so. So this actually should be applauded, Cameron strongly implied in a couple of speeches. Or when there were floods and the vicars canoeing to help people out, this is big society in action. This is what Jesus would have done. Um, be detached, Jane. Come on. Um, now, the crash, though, I think, has changed everything on this. Everything, relatively speaking. Um, and we've seen some very high-profile returns of socialist readings of the Bible to English political discourse and religion. Now, it didn't go away, of course. It was just pushed outside parliamentary debate. Uh, and some of the first signs of this were with Occupy, uh, the picture here, being one of many instances of Jesus in the temple being used in Occupy. This was a, seemed to be a, a favoured image, both in London and elsewhere. Um, Russell Brand was also another interesting example, in, invoking Jesus, Christianity, uh, but he also invoked things that were deemed kind of too Eastern. Uh, and this didn't go down well at all, and he wasn't deemed authentic in any serious way as a representative of Jesus and socialism uh, or anything like this. But Corbyn did, um, and interestingly, I mean, there's been a lot of ironic uses of Corbyn as Christ and all this kind of thing, but there's not been, it's been one area that he's had some protection from the press, interestingly, um, because I think, even the Daily Mail, because there's been, uh, because, rightly or wrongly, he's been tied in with uh, a brand of kind of English radical Christianity, which the Mail, for instance, has defended for years. Uh, and Corbyn de was deemed, again, rightly or wrongly, as kind of an authentic representation of that tradition. Um, and his colleague, Cat Smith, I use Cat Smith, I could have used others, but Cat Smith is from Barrow, which is where I'm from, so I've got a certain bias here. Um, and Cat Smith said something I think was, quite publicly, um, almost unthinkable, um, maybe, you know, ten years before, maybe less. And she said, Jesus was a radical socialist quite openly, and she goes, he inspires my politics, that's why I'm here, um, which I thought was quite striking. But it's also the crash has brought um, reactions on the right, of course. Now, I put Brexit. Uh, Brexit is much more complicated, I think, than is presented. It's not simply a reaction on the right. There's, uh, um, in various working class communities, it cuts across left and right in many ways. But it's certainly presented as a reaction on the right, and that's not entirely inaccurate either, of course. And a number of tropes and ideas associated with the far right, um, at least if any of the studies are, are, are accurate on this, and I think they must be, given what happened with Brexit and so on. Um, there are a number of issues to do with the EU immigration that have become very popular, significantly popular, vote-winningly popular, 
uh, in a way that was toyed with 10 years before and worried about 10 years before, but now at the fore. And Islam throughout all this, and this is tied in with this, Islam in the media in particular has been a big problem. Um, uh, one study showed that Islam over about a 10 year period is mentioned on average 33 times a day in the British press. I went through the uh, press looking for the Bible and found virtually none in a week's worth of material, but you'll find Islam absolutely no problem. Um, and and then another study, a related, actually it was, I think it was the same study, when you type in Islam in related terms over the past 10 years, uh, and you look at the articles, the term terrorism and violence comes up more times in the articles than Islam. So this is, uh, this, this is there in the background constantly. Okay, now, so that's kind of where we are. Again, I've summarised a great deal of work here. Uh, and I'm going to uh, use one example now from Theresa May, and she's repeated this on a couple of occasions in different contexts, whether re in relation to Christmas or uh, uh, perhaps you've seen the, her comments more recently on Easter. Same, same kind of thing. Um, and in September 2016, in a discussion of British laws, culture, values and traditions, such as Christmas, Theresa May stated in Parliament that what we want to see in our society is tolerance and understanding. We want minority communities to be able to recognise and stand up for their traditions, but we also want to be able to stand up for our traditions generally, and that includes Christmas. So why is this distinctive? Well, a year earlier, Cameron certainly made his typical nostalgic claims that Britain is a Christian country and singled out values uh, surrounding Jesus' birth saying that it represents peace, mercy, goodwill, and above all, hope. But it's because of these, and this is a quote from Cameron, important religious roots and Christian values that Britain has been such a successful home to people of all faiths and none. Okay, all faiths and none was a, was a very it was a favorite phrase of Cameron. Now, the idea of the Bible and Christianity representing English or British values, um, and also representing all faiths and none, um, was used by Cameron on a number of occasions when summarising Christian values in relation to liberal British or English values. Elsewhere, these British values of all faiths and none were thought to be found in the Bible and Christianity. And Cameron said, for instance, on the 400th anniversary of the King James Bible, that they include, deep breath, human rights, equality, monarchy, parliamentary democracy, protest freedom, abolish, abolition of slavery, emancipation of women, responsibility, hard work, charity, compassion, humility, self-sacrifice, love, pride in working for the common good, honouring social obligations to one another, and the first forms of welfare provision, which is an interesting addition, actually. Now, we might say that Cameron's paternalistic rhetoric belongs to the pre-Trump, pre-Brexit liberal embrace of others, without inclusion or at least mention of any problematic or illiberal otherness for, Ill, for liberal multicultural discourse. But in a world of uh, Brexit and Trump, May's rhetoric was blunt in identifying the other and its difference, um, but seemingly left open without explicit judgment. And you'll note in May's response the strong distinction between minorities, their traditions, and the assumption of normative British identity, which, well, what is it? It's, it's not entirely clear. But our traditions, Christmas, are emphatically not Diwali or Eid, which is the context here, actually, of the discussion and the point of comparison. Christmas is ours, Eid is theirs. And this Brexit-inspired othering of those deemed, I guess, Asian minorities ought to be clear enough. Perhaps this flirting with a kind of ethno-nationalist construction of Christmas is unsurprising in her then half uh, in her then half-year premiership of this is I'm moved to Christmas now the actual Christmas not September uh, half-year premiership of a red, white, and blue Brexit, a desire to deal with uh, the electoral threat of UKIP, an influential cohort of Leave MPs on the back benches, and most tellingly the Conservative government floating the idea of companies identifying non-British workers. But Cameron had two further distinctive aspects which are either downplayed or replaced in May's Christmas messages. First, Cameron's Christmas was part of his intensification of the inherited liberal economic assumptions about Christianity and the Bible that he received from Thatcher onwards. 
Cameron placed a strong emphasis on providing these services to be deemed beyond those uh, provided by the state, volunteers, charities, which may seem innocuous enough, but he did mention, as I said before, food banks and the, th and the floods for which his government received much criticism. And it's in this context that Cameron was claiming that uh, it's a good thing that we get canoeing vicars or food banks, because this is British values in action. Cameron also mentioned homelessness, but he followed this immediately by pra uh, praising those who help the homeless at Christmas. Now, this emphasis is significantly muted in May's Christmas, uh, and this is repeated re in Cameron's Christmas messages. Now, this is not to say that she is necessarily plotting the downfall of capitalism, uh, but rather represents a kind of post-Brexit political expediency of appealing to the elusive Brexit voter, and I, you know, the, as the cliche of pro-NHS, pro-decent wage, priority for British vulnerable uh, types, anxieties about immigration, dislike of liberal elite, and so on. And this was an early emphasis, an ongoing, I think, emphasis of May's rhetoric. Now, there's plenty more that could be said about May's understanding of minorities, particularly her understanding of Muslims and Islam, and her use of the perversion of Islam trope so common amongst English-based politicians, and the way I think she plays to the far right while simultaneously distancing herself from them. You can read that in a forthcoming book. But for now, this snippet should give some indication of an overall post-Brexit electoral strategy designed to colonise the right and gain even more enthusiastic support from the right-wing press and satisfy conservative Brexiteers and traditional voters while not being too blunt enough to isolate the more liberal conservatives and sympathisers, some of whom were happy enough to hold their nose and vote accordingly, though maybe, of course, not in Red Kensington. <laughs> um, but it was a strategy partly designed to pick up an often older working class vote in a post-industrial era of precarious employment and poverty, disillusioned with their economic lot and abandoned by mainstream politics where anti-immigration, anti-EU and anti-Muslim rhetoric has some support, and where the far right, particularly the English Defence League and UKIP, have had some popularity. And in this respect, it's striking that the 2017 Conservative Party manifesto attacked what the Conservatives uh, and the great icon Margaret Thatcher were typically deemed to represent. So they attacked, the, the manifesto attacked untrammeled free markets with a somewhat vague offer of protection to people working in the gig economy. But it's also couched in language typically assumed to be a deviation from a purer construction of religion in English political discourse. This is a common uh, turn of phrase. The rejection of the cult of selfish individualism. Now, I think there is an assumption here that religion or a broad church is better and more communal but the language here, I think, is also, broadly speaking now, taking Christmas, the manifesto and everything into consideration, um, is a kind of soft ethno-nationalism, a promise of economic protectionism, whilst isolating certain minorities. And I don't think this is too unfamiliar to the admittedly more abrasive rhetoric coming from American political discourse. And this looked, from the perspective of hard electoral scheming, to be a winning ploy before May's somewhat problematic election campaign. Again, keeping distance, professionalism. Uh, according to the YouGov polling uh, published in March 2017, the overwhelming majority would still have voted the same way in the EU referendum. However, it was also revealed that there are a significant majority of people, 69%, who thought that the government should now accept that Brexit should just go ahead. Only 21% against. 49% were confident in May's negotiation skills. 52% thought her proposals were positive for Britain. And we might contrast this with only 15% of people who thought Parliament should vote on whether to accept a deal. Only 15%. My Facebook timeline is full of people who wanted uh, another referendum on the EU, and you would have thought, looking at that, that you know, this somehow represents a huge chunk of the population. Evidently not. 
Similarly, uh, a cluster of anti-immigration, anti-EU, anti-political establishment views appear to have been consistently popular among a section of the older working class voters, while anti-Islam, anti-Muslim feeling has been prominent in polling for years, particularly among older voters, 45 and up, which means I'm a younger voter, of course, uh, and as well, of course, being pervasive in the press. These qualified pro-Brexit and anti-immigrant and anti-Muslim tendencies appear to be reflected in the May uh, 2017 local elections where the Conservatives performed strongly, seemingly absorbing the anti-EU UKIP voters on the right and as the slim 52-48 referendum split was becoming a distant memory. Based on such statistics, some analysts were confident in their predictions of a May landslide. However, such statistics are complicated. People may respond to such questions in the way that they did, of course, but may not prioritise, for instance, a disdain for Islam when voting, or they may not have even had much interest in Brexit other than having an opinion on the matter. Such predictions were also based on the assumption that an older generation would dominate voting at the election. And this was hardly unreasonable, but such predictions also missed the flip side, and that's uh, to such statistics, that there was a younger generation less likely to be hostile to Islam, immigration, and so on. But while also being affected by cuts in education and precarious working patterns. And in this sense, Corbynism offered some sort of alternative, as appears, as far as we know so far, to be reflected in what seems to be the return to two-party politics, at least in this election. Now, the development of Corbynism also foregrounded related understandings of religion and the Bible. Indeed, on his victory as leader of the Labour Party, Corbyn almost immediately began referencing the Bible. In his major, first major television interview on the eve of the 2015 Labour, conference, Labour Party conference, Andrew Marr began explaining who John the Baptist was. But Corbyn immediately interjected, claiming he knew perfectly well who John the Baptist was, and said, I am very familiar with the Bible. I was brought up with the Bible. Now, I also think Corbyn is fully aware of the importance of this source of cultural and political authority and capital. Indeed, Corbyn has been making regular reference, or allusion to, rather, the parable of the Good Samaritan, including in his victory speech. That's good. Now, here's a picture for you. We were talking before about John McDonnell and the Stalin thing. This is what's not been noticed on a lot, uh, a lot of election analysis, is that there is a whole load of memes taking place on Facebook and different groups, and they're hugely popular, and they're very ironic, very playful, but will use Maoist or this tradition. Um, and Andrew Marr noticed this, though, on election night, in fairness. This is the sort of stuff that was going on beneath the surface. Now, um, Corbyn has used his allusions to the Good Samaritan uh, to promote his distinctive st stance on welfare. Um, we don't pass by on the other side of those people rejected by an unfair welfare system. We, oh, sorry, just missed uh, we don't pass by on the other side while the poor lie in the gutter. Almost certainly an allusion to Thatcher here as well, of course. But the Good Samaritan uh, and the allusions to it were also used to connect Corbyn with a specifically British or English socialism, a connection that was typical of his mentor Tony Benn. And it's not without reason that the biblical allusions in his conference speech and in interviews came shortly after the outrage levelled at Corbyn for not singing the national anthem at the Battle of Britain Memorial. And this is what he said you know, shortly afterwards. Solidarity and not walking by on the other side of the street when people are in trouble. These shared majority British values that are the fundamental reason why I love this country and its people. And he, invoked, uh, he also went on to invoke the British socialist, Christian socialist tradition. Uh, and interestingly, uh, the, the rallies you'll have seen, the Corbyn rallies, he keeps bringing up this, we will not walk by on the other side. Almost every rally, apparently. But it's also significant about, what's also significant about this is what it doesn't represent. The Good Samaritan is probably the most common biblical illusion in English party politics today. And for those with ears to hear, it's a parable present for the battle of the soul of the Labour Party and cross-parliamentary views on militarism. David Cameron likewise alluded to the example of the Good Samaritan 
to justify any future military intervention against ISIS in his promotion of British values and the state's monopoly on violence. We cannot just walk by if we are to keep this country safe. We have to confront this menace. We will do so in, in a calm, deliberate way, but with an iron determination. In his speech supporting the bombing of Syria, Hillary Benn, uh, perhaps the most high-profile uh, uh, Labour front bencher, critical of the Corbyn agenda, justified intervention <coughs> with the claim that we have never have and we never should walk by on the other side of the road. The very same parable with the very same sentiment within the parable then can be read to come to the exact opposite position on military intervention, which of course no doubt shows how interpretation is driven by a given political ideology, while the biblical text simultaneously provides the authority. But this use of the Bible also involves how Islam is understood. And in mainstream English political discourse since Blair and perhaps even since Thatcher, Islam, as I said, is assumed to be compatible with and supportive of the liberal democratic state, and the perversion of Islam is required uh, is, uh, to be associated with groups like ISIS or Al-Qaeda and worthy of military attack, and the root of political violence in North Africa, the Middle East, and on the streets of London, Paris, Nice, and Brussels. Oh, sorry, I had the quotes there. There you go. Now, the way that this perversion of Islam trope is used is very important. It's very significant. It's relentlessly used. A politician will never criticise Islam. Not a mainstream one. You know, you'll get some on the back benches or you'll get a U UKIP will go for it and things like this. But not, you know, mainstream Labour or uh, Conservative or Lib Dem. But it's, this is the way that the, uh, you can target then military intervention by saying it's a perversion that needs to be rectified or you can do it domestically with the, say the prevent strategy or something we're targeting perversions of Islam and it's interesting that you can that certain awards have been given for the right interpretation of the Quran but it's also um, yeah here we go but it's also been used on the left in a, in a way that um, is not that common uh, and Corbyn has also employed this uh, phrase, the perversion of Islam, or, or, and related phrases. Um, and what he's used it for is to say, because ISIS are a perversion of Islam, we should stop funding them, or Saudi Arabia, you know, and stop the, the chain of money going through to ISIS. Because it's such a distortion of Islam, there is no negotiating with ISIS, interestingly. Now, this you may or may not have seen. Another, this is something I think... Uh, um, Whilst I think lots has been opened up on the right of English political discourse, a lot's been opened on, on the left of English political discourse. And you may have seen in the press over the past year um, English, Scottish and Irish fighters in northern Syria who are fighting for kind of uh, social change and fighting ISIS on uh, behalf, behalf of kind of um, a feminist uprising in many ways in northern Syria. And they have supported Corbyn quite strongly. Now, this didn't make the press very often, but this did. And you've got to hear, smash ISIS, vote Corbyn. Uh, and their logic is that, well, Theresa May supports Saudi Arabia. Corbyn doesn't. He, will, he thinks that uh, ISIS is, a, is such a, a perversion that it shouldn't be funded. And they've taken that line even further and said we should just get rid of the language of uh, whether it's Islam or extremist Islam and just talk about Saudi Arabia. There's no need to talk about Islam, almost. This is the Bob Crow Brigade, and they're named after um, the late union leader, Bob Crow of the RMT. And they came, and they, and they came to uh, media prominence uh, just over, about a year ago uh, in the Labour leadership election when Owen Smith, of course, implied that there should be negotiations with ISIS and was kind of largely ridiculed for this, and Corbyn denied it. And so they started tweeting Owen Smith uh, and you can see here, um, want to talk to ISIS, tell that to the martyrs of Man Bij, with a quote from Bob Crow. And they attacked Hillary Benn as well. And you can see this has made the Times, it made the Independent, uh, Morning Star, but that wasn't a tremendous surprise in this context. Uh, but it did make the media. And this was, I mean, this is the line that uh, Corbyn has been implying, but those on the Corbyn supporting further left have been pushing fairly hard, actually. Now, there's another aspect of religion here relating to Corbyn that's um, really, really come to the fore since he became leader. And that's um, Corbyn in 
relation to the national media. <coughs> now, I mean, it's, I'm, I'm probably not telling anyone anything new when I point out that Corbyn got a fairly bad press from the national media and some, you know, some of the, here's some of the wilder allegations, he, he, allegations levelled at him. There is one I didn't put up on here that Corbyn was prepared to ban Christmas. Um, but thankfully, one Tory MP saved us from that. OK, so, you know, revealed how Jeremy Corbyn welcomed the prospect of an asteroid wiping out humanity, attacked Pridge and Prejudice and demanded a ban of Action Man toys, abolished the army, new leader's potty plan for world peace, uh, plan to turn Britain to Zimbabwe, etc., etc. And this is all, I guess, fairly well known. But there's been a number of um, studies done on uh, the representation of, the Cor of Corbyn in the English-based media in particular. And again, no surprise, but it's fairly overwhelmingly clear that, that, that there was a great deal of hostility. But for me, one of the interesting things was the hostility that came from the left, from The Guardian. The Guardian were very strong in the condemnation of Corbyn and did some interesting things, I think, in relation to the way religious language is being used. Uh, just to give one example, and there's, there's, um, in the first week when Corbyn looked like he was going to win the Labour leadership contest, uh, there was something like 20-something articles in one week denouncing Corbyn. Um, but the language here has been used of him has been, I mean, I've given a list of them here, pharisaical, puritan, sect, cult, like Charles Manson, according to one Guardian article. Uh, not quite, he didn't quite go that far, but, you know, it's a sect, so it's something similar. Zealot, he believes in a higher cause, an apocalyptic tendency, all against the notion of a broad church. So you get the idea that the, uh, anything too enthusiastic deviating from an assumed broad church, uh, kind of uh, you know, uh, broad parliamentary agreement, centrism or whatever, has to be deemed in this sort of language. Puritan, sect, cult. Um, others, very similarly uh, related terms, fundamentalism, like ISIS was one, like Stalinism, which may not be 100% inaccurate, we've we heard before. Um, now, the function of this is and it comes through in a number of them, is that this is irrational, an irrational deviation from rational thought. Um, and as it turns out, I mean, this was, this, is, this is huge in The Guardian over the past, it's been huge until recently when there seems to be a bit of a shift, I think, in The Guardian over the past few days. Um, it's, uh, I mean, I've, I've given one example, and this is from Polly Toynbee. I envy their certainty the way you can envy the religious... Uh, their delusions. Uh, now that's quite unusual actually because the, the newspapers, including The Guardian, will largely be more respectful of religion. It's only people like uh, known atheists, Polly Toynbee's, Richard Dawkins, who will openly criticise religion per se. It always has to be a, some kind of distortion of religion that's criticised. But it's the same logic. Um, it's irrational to believe in this kind of thing. And as it turns out, there's a, actually a very long history of this in, in the West, um, which com, uh, contrasts a kind of rational, whatever the agreed centre of politics is, is the rational uh, liberal centre, with um, anything outside, anything challenging that deemed to be kind of anti-liberal, anti-capitalist, sometimes far right, uh, and so on. But interestingly, over the past week, there's oddly been an, and this is a surprise to me, a kind of embrace of this sort of language of enthusiasm by some on The Guardian, people who were once critical of Corbyn. And I think this is probably indicative of the way that the political consensus is starting to shift at the moment, that it is opening up more on the left, as it has uh, for some time, I think, on the right. So I think we're in interesting times in that respect. And we should, of course, mention Tim Farron. Um, you can Google him if you don't know who he is. Um, now, Tim Farron is an interesting figure in this because he represents a third strand of what's going on, not simply because he's a Lib Dem, actually, for, but uh, for other reasons that I hope will become clear. Now, Farron um, has certainly stressed the importance of things like welcoming refugees with re in relation to Christmas, uh, and I think in many ways did catch the tone of Remainers. But, as we know, there was no Remainer boost that went to the Lib Dems, and it seems that Corbyn was that, the beneficiary of that, for whatever reason. Nevertheless, there is one aspect associated with Farron which does tell us something about English political discourse and its construction of religion. 
As his 2016 Christmas address showed, Tim Farron is, I think for a post Thatcher politician, unusually forthright in his Christian beliefs, openly evangelical, though he doesn't ultimately stray too far, actually, from general liberal constructions of Christianity in the Bible. Tim Farron really doesn't want to talk about the details of this. Um, so, you know, one quote from Farron in uh, one of his infamous interviews on his faith. But do you know what, as a Christian, I think Chris, uh, uh, Christmas, oh, this is the Christmas, forget that, this is from his Christmas speech. Do you know what, as a Christian, I think Christmas is about God who gave himself up for us and came to earth in order to do that, who urges us to follow him and to believe that we should do to, uh, to others what we uh, have done to ourselves. Now, there are good reasons why Farron wants to keep certain controls when he opens his Bible, because he's had to deal with questions about whether he thinks homosexuality, or more precisely, homo homoerotic sex, is a sin. Now, it's quite possible that he did indeed think this, and it's quite possible he still perhaps does think this, but it's not the sort of thing a political leader <coughs> of a party can readily admit, of a mainstream political party, UKIP, well, or DUP perhaps aside. Farron, therefore, made the classic liberal distinction uh, and noted favourably by some activists and cross-party MPs I interviewed between his personal Christian morality and his public political liberalism, which tolerates other groups and individuals either irrespective of whether they are personally agreeable. So, you know, Farron or, no, let's say, a, a, an MP could be, say, hostile to uh, homosexual sex but still vote for gay marriage because, you know, that's a personal belief in relation to tolerating other views. It's a view I think Farron probably did hold. Um, and this for Farron has been crucial to him to be, uh, for being both a Christian and a liberal, big L, little L liberal. In addition to claiming that we are all sinners, to get around the problem of a potential media condemnation, as seen in the particularly difficult Channel 4 news interview on this topic shortly after he became leader, Farron's approach is actually, was actually typical enough in political discourse, and he did something very similar to what Tony Blair and Barack Obama did, and Russell Brand, interestingly. And that would be to focus on a more liberal and inverted commas part of the Bible to uh, over against or stressed over a more illiberal, again in inverted commas, part. In the case of Farron, when he was confronted by the interviewer with the illiberal Leviticus 18.22, you shall not lie with a male as one lies with a female, it's an abomination. The solution was to point to Jesus instead, and the favoured biblical passage more amenable to contemporary liberalism, Matthew 7 verse 3. You don't pick the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye when there is a plank in your own. That was Farron's paraphrase. Now interestingly, one liberal democrat activist I spoke to said that there was much support from within the party uh, for Farron on this. Uh, and by making the familiar move to a more palatable aspect of the Bible, that Farron was instead deemed to be strong on social justice, for instance, and they were very pleased with this. Nevertheless, the presence of liberal constraints on Farron's public presentation of Christianity was effectively confirmed by a number of politicians I interviewed, and notably ones from different parties and perspectives. One MP from a different party told me that Farron handled the situation well, while another wished Farron could have been more explicit in his views, but claimed that, well, there's a problem keeping the party on side, and secularism makes it difficult for him. And presumably here, secularism is being constructed as pro-gay sex, and religion constructed as anti-gay sex, I think. By way of contrast, a senior politician from another party um, thought that Farron should simply oppose homophobia and support gay sex, or else he must be deemed to be an irrelevance to political debate. And there is a likely allusion to this sort of thinking when it was reported from the Labour Party conference in 2015 that Angela Eagle criticised Farron for being an evangelical Christian who believes in the literal truth of the Bible at a time of a huge fundamentalist revival in religious belief, interestingly, she said. And added, he just doesn't want to talk about it a lot because he knows how much it will embarrass his own party. Now, these are all different views, of course, on the situation, but... Significantly, there's the assumption um, that if you're open in opposing homosexual sex, it's not an option for a leader of one of the main parties and not an option for a public presentation of religion or the Bible. 
Despite such pressures, Farron's dealing with this issue early in his leadership by effectively refusing to comment on the problematic biblical verses seemed to have worked for him, in that the issue didn't haunt the party until the general election. By this time, the pressure on Farron to come clean about his compatibility with a more acceptable liberalism presumably weighed heavy, as he first said that being in a gay relationship was not a sin, which is a very interesting move because that wasn't the issue at hand. And then he got asked in the next interview and really dealing with the theological technicality director, he said, homosexuality, homosexual sex is not a sin. Issue forgotten. Well, not with all voters. So there you have it. There are three, and no doubt more, but three major tendencies at play in English political discourse since the 2008 crash. A kind of soft ethno-nationalism whilst trying to, down, uh, trying to support those on the gig economy or something like this. Something like Corbynism and that construction of religion. And this vague liberalism remains dominant as well. Apart from this liberalism, though, this liberalism cuts right across party politics. None of this has yet crystallised. With Corbynism seemingly in the ascendancy, uh, the socially liberal Tories emboldened after May's de defeat, and the emergence of the DUP in English political discourse, the potential for more to happen before the ideological dust settles ought to be clear. Thank you.